All right, just want to welcome everyone in person and online. We, do, we have five birthdays to recognize from yesterday until today. Let's see, it's six. Uh, we got Evan and Peggy yesterday. Oh, and Michelle. Okay, Evan, sorry, Michelle. So much going on in my head. We have, so it's St. Patrick's Day today. So it's St. Patrick's Day today. And we have yesterday was Evan's birthday, Michelle's birthday, and Peggy's birthday. So happy birthday to you. And then today we have Michael's birthday, Kim's birthday, and Robert's birthday. So they are doubling the celebration. So anyway, Angie, Angie got this like card. Michael's not in here. Angie got this like dorky, funny card. We're, we're doubling like the city. The celebration. So anyway, corny, corny, terrible dad joke. So anyway, I'm going to get quickly moved from that. So happy birthday, everyone. Um, that's crazy. We have uh, six birthdays in two days. That's wild. Okay, so what we're going to do now, just since coming back from the trip to Africa, what, what dad and Michael and myself, we felt like when we were in Africa is we needed to share uh, these, uh, the, um, not every single one of these teachings, because I was 22 teachings, but we needed to share uh, one of these teachings from the trip for each, for about eight weeks. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start a series called uh, of The Glorious Church, and we're going to talk about one of these different topics that we talked about, uh, God's, God's eternal purpose, the need for forerunners, the bride making herself ready, salvation, eternal rewards, the indwelling life of Christ, things like that. And so for about the next eight weeks or so, we're going to talk about the glorious church. And today what I want to do is lay out a vision of the glorious church. And that's the title of this message is a vision for the glorious church. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and we want to read Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Um, and we want to do, just walk through what Paul said in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. And Paul is, of course, writing to the Ephesians. And if you read closely the book of Ephesians, it's very clear. Paul is unveiling the, God's eternal plan and God's eternal purpose to the Ephesians. And, it's, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about that, but it's very clear that this book is written to explain God's eternal purpose in Jesus Christ. Now, in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, let's read here. Paul says, Husbands, love your, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Okay, just, just take note of that phrase right there, the church in all of her glory. And the King, New King James Version says, a glorious church. And that's really the, the driving scripture for this series is the Lord is going to have a glorious church before he comes back. It doesn't look like it right now <laughs> at all. It looks like the exact opposite, but God in his word has promised there will be a glorious church before he comes back, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And so what I want to do in this message today is I want to just do five different things. Is number one, I want to talk about why this message of a glorious church, getting a vision of a glorious church is so important. Number two, I want to give a detailed explanation of Ephesians 5, 25 through, or 25, 25 through 27. Just want to walk through what Paul talked about in that passage of Scripture. Then number three, I want to talk about the revival that's coming, which some many have called a bridal revival. Number four, I want to talk about the end time move of the Spirit, how it's going to be characterized by the Word and the Spirit operating in perfect unity and balance together. And, and, and then number, uh, number five, I want to talk about seven hallmarks of, a glo of the glorious church at the end of the age. So that's where we're going to go in this message. Um, when you look at the church right now, the church is in an absolute mess right now. And I believe that as we have been saying for a while and many have been saying for a while, God is shaking everything that can be shaken. 
That means he's shaking governments, he's, cha- he's shaking financial institutions, he's ta- shaking nations, he's shaking everything that can be shaking, but he is definitely shaking right now the church, especially the charismatic church. Judgment begins in the house of God. Before God's judgment comes to the world, it comes first to the church. We're experiencing that right now. Um, and if you look around at the church, especially you know us being charismatic and the charismatic movement who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when you look around at the church today, you see, you know, just it, it really is heartbreaking. It really grieves your heart, um, not in a self-righteous way, but more of a like, God, I don't want this in me. You know, Lord, I'm not just pointing a finger saying how wicked and evil they are. I'm looking here and saying, God, I don't want any of this in me. But if you look at the church today, just the moral compromise, the, the lack of Christ-likeness, the unfaithfulness, the abuse of leadership, worldliness, deception, false doctrines, false prophecies, the self-centeredness, the carnality, the lukewarmness, and the apathy, I mean, that's just the beginning. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, there's this meme or this, this saying floating around social media right, uh, recently that if Paul saw the church in America, we would be getting a letter. <laughs> if Paul saw the church in America, if he were alive today, the church in America would be getting a letter. And there's another meme I saw that was building upon that. And he was talking about Paul, what he would say. Someone said this, that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus to the churches of the United States of America, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't even really know where to begin with you guys. I mean, we are in, I mean, I say that laugh and with a joke, but we are in a mess right now. It's heartbreaking, honestly. It, it really is. It's like I've, I've spent the last... Since October, I've spent the last whatever many months that is, three, four months, five months, just grieving, just grieving, and, and not in a self-righteous way, but just grieving over the state of the church and where we're at and, you know, just knowing God wants to have a bride that is without spot, stain, or blemish, knowing God wants to have a church that is glorious, knowing this thing, seeing our condition, it's just been heartbreaking. Um... I can't even imagine what the Lord would say if the book of Revelation were written today. I mean, can you imagine what, you know, the rebuke, Revelation 2 and 3, that he gave to these seven churches, what would he say to the church today in America? I mean, I don't even know what he would say. But with all the recent exposure of, in the prayer, prophetic, and worship movement that has been going on over the last few years, you know, God is definitely bringing judgment to the church. And... It's important, I believe it's important, you know, we, the church loves it when the, the Holy Spirit is poured out and there's a revival going on, but that revival, a revival of, that God's pouring out and the judgment God's pouring out, both are moves of God. And it, it's foolish not to learn all that we can learn of what is happening right now as God is shaking the church, because It's not just like God's shaking them. God's shaking us, too. So we want to make sure that we see what God's doing, what God's exposing, and all those things to make sure, okay, we want to come into alignment with the Word of God. Where are we off? Where are we um, out of balance? Where do we need adjustment? Where do we need to repent? So... Anyway, with all of that, I mean, we, if we, we spent a lot of time focused on that, we would all be discouraged, hopeless, and depressed. But here's, but I, I don't want to focus on that today in this message. I want to focus on the good part. And the good news is this, is that it, in spite, despite the current condition of the church, and it's not just America, it's all around the world. We've been to Africa. We know the end. I mean, Africa is just as much a mess as, as America all, really, it's, it's, there's a remnant right now, it seems, that's really pressing in to what God wants. And honesty and transparency and authentic truth, who's taking the mask off and just saying, God, we want to be vulnerable and we want to be real. We want to be true in our most inward parts. And so, anyway, we're not going to focus on the mess we're in. We're going to focus on the vision that God has laid out in his word. Because if we focused on the mess we're in, we would just get discouraged, hopeless, and depressed. We're gonna, but Scripture is very clear. Jesus will have a glorious church before he returns. Okay? 
So we don't need a prophetic word. We've got it written in the authority of God's word that there will be a glorious church before he comes back. Amen. It is absolutely going to happen by the authority of God's word. It may not look like it. In fact, probably what we're seeing right now is God moving towards him having a pure and spotless bride. That is part of the purification process that is going on right now. But I just want to assure you, the Lord is not going to return until the church is glorious, the church is holy, sanctified, and blameless. So you, can, you and I both, despite the shaking, despite the judgment, despite the refining, despite the exposure, despite those things, God is raising up a glorious church. He has said it in his word. It is as good as done. It, was, it is absolutely going to happen. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Jesus will have a glorious church when he comes back. Amen and amen. So praise God for that good news, okay? So what I want to do now is just walk through Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 to lay the vision of this that Paul is laying out in apostolic authority, writ the, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of what God said he would do before he comes back, before the Lord comes back. The first thing we want to look at is uh, what Paul said. He said, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself up for her. This is talking about the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, we're coming up to Easter in a couple weeks, and, you know, that where we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's Paul saying that Jesus loved the church, and he gave himself up for her. And so what Paul is saying here, he's really drilling in on, is the atonement of Jesus Christ. His atonement for our sins made the way for our justification. And so when we talk about atonement, there's a few things, and I'm going to talk about this more in a couple weeks, but when we talk about the atonement, when we talk about Christ laying his life down, there's a few things we've got to understand if we want to understand atonement. Is number one is the necessity of atonement. That God is absolutely holy. God is absolutely righteous. When Isaiah saw the Lord... He saw the holiness of God, and Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. God is holy, God is righteous, God is transcendent. And there is an absolute necessity of atonement because of sin. See, the second thing we got to know about atonement is sin must be punished. Sin must be punished because God is holy. Anything that violates God's holiness and righteousness must be punished. Otherwise, God would not be a God of justice. And as a result of that, God's wrath is upon sin. So we don't preach this anymore in the church because people don't like to hear about this kind of message, but it's the gospel. This is the gospel. This is Romans, that God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men from heaven who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because God is holy and because sin must be punished, the Lord has directed his wrath upon all sin. And the penalty of sin is eternal separation from God and eternal death. The next thing we've got to understand about atonement is atonement in, in, about atonement is that absolute righteousness. Listen. Absolute righteousness is essential. If you break the law, even one commandment in, in motive, thought, or deed, you've broken the entire law, 613 commandments. To have, to come into the presence of God, absolute righteousness is essential. And so the only way, uh, this is Romans, the only way we could ever have absolute righteousness is to keep the law in heart, motive, and deed perfectly. One violation of the law, one thought of coveting, one thought of lust, boom, we've broken the entire law. We're in trouble, right? Our only hope, apart from keeping the law in heart, motive, and motive, thought, and deed, is to have 
the righteousness of one who has kept the law imputed to us so that we would then be reckoned to have kept the law like the one who did. And the only one who has lived based upon the law in perfection and absolute righteousness is the man, Jesus Christ. And because on the cross, when he became that atoning sacrifice and we put our faith in him, his righteousness, his absolute righteousness is imputed to us so that we are considered to be righteous in him. That's the gospel. That's justification by faith. And so when Jesus was on the cross, and it talks about, Paul talked about this, that that he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The sins of the entire world were imputed to Christ on the cross. And when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, Father, I forgive them. And Jesus, as he was dying, said, it is finished. And Jesus became that atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus became our propitiation, our propitiatory sacrifice. That word basically means satisfaction. That basically means God satisfied with the death of his son. Because God, ha- because God is a God of holiness, God is also a God of justice. And if God did not punish sin, he would not be a God of justice. So God punished sin on the cross. He released his justice upon Christ on the cross so that God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. That is atonement. And so because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ, because like what Paul said, he gave himself up for the church, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us so that in Christ we are reckoned or credited to be righteous. Therefore, the penalty we owe of, of eternal separation from God has been paid by Jesus on the cross and the righteousness that is required to come into his presence has been imputed to us so that credited to our account is the, is the death of Christ and the righteousness of Christ. And when that happens, God stamps upon us justified justified by faith. We can never, ever depart from justification by faith. I don't care how mature we get. Paul never departed from it. Even when, even when he wrote the book of Philippians, towards the end of his life, he says, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that's derived from the law, but the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He was talking about imputed righteousness. He was talking about justification by faith. Even, at his, even in his dying, not dying, but close to death years. So when Paul said, Jesus gave himself up for us, he's talking about his atoning sacrifice. He's talking about um, justification. Now, we want to look at what Paul says next. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her. Sanctification and cleansing. Justification and sanctification are not the same thing. Many, many Christians get this confused. They wrap it all together. Yes, they're connected, but they are different. Justification is by faith alone. Sanctification is by faith, works, obedience, taking up your cross, saying yes to God, you know, allowing him to do a deep work of the Holy Spirit, being faithful, but that's not required in justification. Required in justification is by faith alone. Required in sanctification is faith, obedience, works, taking up your cross, denying yourself, obeying, being faithful, overcoming. And so what what Paul is saying here is that built upon the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ is God's work of sanctification, is God's work of cleansing, is what the Lord is, wants to do to prepare the bride to be glorious. And so I like the way the New King James Version says this. It's that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Cleansing, sanctification, they are really the same thing. And so let's just talk about this word sanctification just for a second. This word means to sanctify, to consecrate, to make holy. See, the process, sanctification requires a lifetime. Justification is in one moment. Sanctification takes a lifetime. If you live to be 70, 80, 90, 100, 
It's going to take that many years to sanctify you into the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it is slow. It's painful. It cuts deep. It puts you to death. <clears throat> there's, there's no shortcuts to sanctification. Justification is free, and it costs you nothing. It costs Christ everything. Sanctification is costly, and it costs you your entire life. And they're different. God is raising up a church that is being sanctified. God is raising up a church, and as we build on this word, cleanse, this word cleanse, to purify, to make clean. It's talking about here the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, sanctification and cleansing, flowing out of justification. So, just to, just to bring a little bit of clarity here to the difference between justification and sanctification and glorification, just, just want to say this, just to drill it into us. Paul talked about in his epistles, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. You have been saved relates to justification. And when you have been saved, that's what God did when he transformed your spirit and all that we talked about in the indwelling life class, when God transformed your spirit, when the indwelling spirit came to dwell in your human spirit, that refers to justification. You are being saved relates to sanctification. And when Paul says you will be saved, that relates to glorification. Justification relates to your spirit. Sanctification relates to your soul. Glorification relates to your body. When you get a new body at the resurrection... Justification delivers you from the penalty of sin, which is hell, which is eternal separation from God. Sanctification delivers you from the power of sin, which is at work in your body, so that you would become conformed into the image of Christ. And glorification delivers you from the pollution or the presence of sin. So when we talk about the bride being made ready, when we talk about the the purification of the bride. We're talking about sanctification. Okay, we're talking about sanctification. We're talking about this lifelong process of being made ready. Okay, the next thing that um, we want to look at in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 is what Paul said that how does he do it? He washes the bride by, the, by water. And he says the water of his word. Now, this, this reminds me of the mikvah. In the ancient Jewish culture, there, there was this thing called the mikvah or the ritual bath. Dad's talked about this in this bride class. But this, uh, this played a crucial role in marriage. Is that before a marriage, the bride and sometimes the groom would immerse themselves in a mikvah to, uh, before the wedding to symbolize spiritual purification and preparation for the covenant of marriage. And so when Paul says he washes her by the water of the word, he's, he's talking about this ancient Jewish custom in Jewish weddings, the mikvah, the washing of the water of the word of God, sanctifying the bride. Next, Paul says here, okay, how does he do it? By the word. Paul says by the washing of the water, by the word, with the word. Now, I didn't realize this until studying this message, but this word, word, is rhema. I did not know that. I just, I just never, really, never really paid much attention to it. Maybe Dad even talked about it and I was had zoned off or something, but maybe he didn't. I don't know. But this word rhema, how does God prepare the bride? He prepares the bride by his rhema. There's a difference between logos, logos, the, the Word of God, I pointed to my iPad because my Bible's here. I don't even use a physical Bible anymore, because mainly because I can't see it. But his logos, his written word, and is, is, is the Bible, his rhema is his spoken word. And so what, what the Lord is saying here, this is why this is why the prophetic movement is so important. This is why the prophetic movement is so important. Whatever you want to call it, the prophetic, which has now become, unsadly, pathetic. It really is. It really has. It's sad. 
But the, the voice of the Lord is how the bride is made ready. One reason there's an attack on the prophetic is because Satan knows that when the true prophetic comes, the bride will be made ready. Therefore, one of his greatest attacks in spiritual warfare is to attack the prophetic. It's by God's rhema. It's by the rhema word of God, the bride is made ready. How does Jesus wash the bride? By his rhema, by his spoken word. And we'll talk about in more detail exactly what that means. But the Greek word for rhema is that which is, what, what it means, rhema, what it means is, according to uh, Thayer's, is that which is, that which is or has been uttered by the living voice. See, the rhema is God's living voice. How we need the living voice of God. God's voice is life. God's voice is active. God's voice, the spirit, is alive and active. This word rhema means any sound produced by the voice having definite meaning, speech, discourse, and utterance. So you get the idea that rhema, logos, means that which is written. Rhema means that which is spoken. It denotes what is, uh, it denotes what, that which is spoken, which is uttered in speech or writing. It's the spoken or living word of God. I love that. That's why, that's why what we talk about so often is forerunners, messengers, prophetic ministers are so important to the preparation of the bride of Jesus Christ. I just, I remember when, when I first was making a transition out of the Baptist church into the charismatic church, and I realized, wait, you know, because I had been taught in the Baptist church for so long, you know, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased, and I never really believed it deep down, but that's just kind of the inferred message that God doesn't do that stuff anymore, that passed away with the apostles. But when I, when I realized, okay, you can actually hear the voice of God and you can prophesy over people, man, I got so excited. I, me and my friends, we were just getting out of college. We would go, I remember we went to this conference and we just wanted to go so we could prophesy over people. I mean, if you, had, if you were living and breathing, I wanted to prophesy over you. I was so like, you know, gung-ho about it. And I remember this one time, this lady was sitting, this lady was sitting um, in front of me and from the back, she looked like, you know, she would definitely have grandchildren, just the way her hair was. And so I was getting this quote-unquote word from God that, you know, her grandkids were, had strayed and, you know, God wanted to save them and lead them to be missionaries and all this stuff. And afterwards, I like, I tapped her on the, I mean, I was, if you, literally, I was going to prophesy over anything that moved or breathed. I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, ma'am, um, I got a word for you. And when she turned around, I'm like, she's 20 or 30 years younger than I thought from the back. I was like, there's no way she's a grandmother. I'm like, this is going to be so offensive. So I was like, ma'am, I got a word for you. And she's like, oh, please tell me. I'm like, actually, I'm not sure I do. <laughs> so she's like, no, no, tell me, tell me. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't, I think, I don't, I think I miss the Lord. No, tell me the word. I'm like, do you have grandchildren? And you know, you could tell she's like, no, do I look like it? You know, so anyway, I just, I don't even know what I said. I made something up like, you know, if and when you have grandchildren, pray for them. I just made something up. And when I was walking away, I was so embarrassed. And I remember my friend was, or was with me and we were walking away and I heard her husband come up and like, I could hear as we're walking, her husband go, what was that all about? And she's like, oh, well, he had a prophetic word for me. And the husband was like, was it prophetic or pathetic? So, yeah, I mean, I went in totally, <clears throat> anyway, I, I could share a million stories about how I did not hear the voice of God, but, you know, I don't even know what that has to do with my message, but basically the prophetic movement has really become pathetic, and we need the recovery of the voice of God and what the voice of the Lord is really intended to do, and that's to prepare the bride for Jesus Christ. The bride is made ready by the rhema of God, by the rhema of God, whether it's rhema, rhema, I don't know, rhema, rhema, I don't know. But 
The rhema of God, the spoken voice of God is how the bride is made ready. So Vines talks about the distinction between the rhema and the logos and says, that, says this, the significance of rhema as distinct from logos is exemplified in the injunction to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, talking about Ephesians 6, 17. Here the reference is not to the whole Bible as such, but to the individual scripture which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in time of need. It is a requirement, a requirement for this is that we are, we, a requirement is that we, there's regular storing of the mind with scripture. So in other words, what, is, what Vines is telling us is that we've got to do the hard work of studying the Bible, reading the Bible, properly interpreting the scriptures, understanding context, understanding the larger story, understanding doctrine, understanding theology, those kinds of things. And it's when we get that into our mind, then the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit breathes upon that word. And when the word understood in truth is joined together with the power of the Holy Spirit, then there's a power that's released to, into the, those who hear when it's spoken and uttered that does a work of cleansing. We must have the word and the spirit for the bride to be made ready. Just a couple of examples here. Um, in scripture, when, when you see the, when, this is why it's so important to dig into the Greek and to find out, okay, what is, what word was being used? Because when you look at, when you just read scripture alone, it, okay, every, like for example, Matthew 4, 4 is that a man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of God's mouth. That word, word is rhema, which means the, the spoken word of God. Not only are we to read the scriptures, but we are to live every day by feasting upon the living word that comes out of God's mouth. Just like the children of Israel would go and gather manna, we are to gather our spiritual manna every day, not just, Lord, what did you say in the book of Ephesians, but, Lord, what are you saying? So we need both, okay? Please understand, we need both. We need Bible study and we need to listen to the voice of God. We need both. I'm not trying to stress one or the other. I'm stressing both. We need Bible study. We need to understand context. We need to understand proper interpretation. We need to understand the Greek or Hebrew. And we need to say, Lord, what are you speaking today? The rhema word of God is what we live on. Another example now, I, just, I just saw this this week, and I was like, I'd never seen that before. In Luke 137, when, when, um, when the Lord, I think it was Gabriel, said, for nothing will be impossible with God, that word nothing is actually, uh, is actually two or three Greek words that mean not any rima will be impossible with God. I never knew that. Not any rima. In other words, when God's, voice speaks that which God speaks will be nothing will be impossible with it so in other words sometimes people quote this well, nothing is impossible with God well yeah I mean nothing's impossible but he's not going to do it if he didn't speak it first you see what I'm saying what well, this is telling us yeah nothing is impossible with God but God's only going to do what he speaks is did we have a rhema from God? Did we have the word of the Lord? Did we have the voice of the, of the Lord? Did we have the utterance, the living and active voice of God? If we had that word, then nothing that, what, everything God said will happen, will come to pass. Another one is uh, Luke th 3 verse 2. The word, the rhema of God came to John in the wilderness. See, John was in the wilderness, and we're thinking, man, that sounds so boring, it sounds so hard, but John was feasting upon the living voice of God. The Pharisees of his day were going and they were getting the knowledge of the scriptures, which we need, but they'd never heard his voice. 
John was in the wilderness, the dry, arid wilderness with, with just, you know, the challenges of living in the wilderness, but he was feasting on the living words of God. See, the bride to be made ready, she's going to be made ready through the Rima word of God. Jesus said, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words, the Rima that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. God's Rima, God's living voice is spirit it's not going to be communicated to your mind first. It's going to be communicated to your spirit because it's spiritual. And it, it, it's communicated. We talked about this one in Indwelling Life. Your spirit receives spiritual words, which then transfer up into your thinking, into your reasoning and logic so you understand them. But the, the Rema word of God is spiritual. So if we're trying to hear God with our mind, we're probably not going to hear God. We've got to hear him with our spirit because our spirit is how we receive the voice of God because his words are spirit. And his, not, his words are not only spirit, but his words are life. When God speaks, life comes. Anytime God speaks, life is released. God cannot help but releasing life when he speaks. When the voice of God comes, God's voice, God's voice brings life. When Jesus told Lazarus, he said, come forth, Lazarus had no choice but to raise from the dead because the living voice of God wrote, uh, caused death to come to life. In fact, he had to say his name so everyone in the grave didn't come forth. <laughs> his voice is spirit and his voice is life. If you feel like I feel dead, I feel dry, I feel, you know, like I'm disconnected, it's the voice of God that brings life. It's the voice of God uttered and spoken that is going to sanctify and purify the bride. In John 15, 7, the Lord said, if you abide in me, you know, we did 20 plus sessions in dwelling life about abiding. If you abide in me and my words, my rhema abides in you, not just, okay, we have to have the written word of God because the spirit activates and quickens the written word of God. If you don't know the written word of God, he has nothing to work with. So we've got to be students of the scriptures, but it's not just enough to have Bible knowledge. We've got to have the spirit illuminating, the spirit breathing, the spirit uh, revealing what this written word means because He's the one who knows what the meaning is. He, he knows what he inspired Paul to write or John to write. If you abide in me and my words, my rhema, my rhema abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The key to uh, uh, answered prayer is abiding in Christ and hearing his voice, hearing his rhema. See, if we're, if we're not abiding in Christ in an intimate relationship, our prayers are not going to be answered. And if we're not hearing his rima, our prayers are going to be hindered. We've got to abide in him and hear his voice, that living, quickening voice of God spiritually. Another, last example here is Romans 10, 17. Um, Paul said, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word or the rhema of Christ. See, faith does not just come by reading the Bible, even though this is important. Faith comes when verses in the Bible are energized by the Holy Spirit. Faith comes when verses in the Bible are quickened by the Holy Spirit, and you're reading it, and it's like, whoa, this just leaped off the page. We must have the rhema of God. We must have that active voice of God for faith to be activated. Okay, so how does God purify the bride by his living active word? He sanctifies her by speaking his living and active word. And he does this by the following ways. Number one, the spirit brings to our remembrance a scripture. The spirit teaches us as we read scripture 
or he reveals to us what a verse or passage in Scripture means. That's number one. It's the Spirit brings to our remembrance the Scripture. That's why reading the Bible, the discipline of reading the Bible is very important. He teaches us as we read the Scripture, or he reveals to us the meaning of a verse or a passage of Scripture. Number two, the Spirit speaks a personal word to us as we fellowship with him in the secret place or as we abide in him throughout the day. It's like Dad was talking about last Sunday. His message I thought was awesome. If you didn't listen to it, go listen to that message, communing with Christ. It was so good. Um, is a lot of times in the secret place, just pressing into the secret place, we may not hear anything, but later that day, if we're cutting the grass or we're riding our bike or walking, all of a sudden, in our spirit, things begin to happen. Things be God begins to speak. God's voice begins to be activated, and we're hearing his voice. The third way God speaks through his uh, rima is the, the Spirit speaks to us through someone else by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God might give someone a word of knowledge. God might give someone a prophecy. God might give someone a word of wisdom. Um, and God might speak to, the, to you through another person what he's trying to say to you and confirm to you. Number And, and let me just say this. Most of the time, that should be confirmation. Most of the time. Not always, but most of the time, if you're really pressing in to hear the Lord's voice, it should confirm what he's already speaking to you. God doesn't want us dependent upon a prophetic word from someone else. God wants us to hear him for ourselves. Okay, this is very important. So much, I mean, just it's one of the problems in the charismatic church is we're looking to other people to hear from God when God says, no, I've given you the ability to hear from me directly. Now, there's a place where God speaks to other people that we can't just get in the secret place, but be because he speaks it through people he's chosen, but it, for the most part, it should be confirmation. For the most part, it should be confirmation when God speaks to us through someone else. Number four, the fourth way God speaks through his rhema is the Spirit anoints fivefold ministers, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, to preach and teach the Word of God and to speak what the Spirit is saying to the church. I think Dad's going to hit on this some next week. The, the importance of fivefold ministry of Ephesians 4:11 is so important that that God raises up leaders who hear from God and God through them through the spoken word of God through the preaching of the word of God is one of the primary ways that Jesus purifies his bride purifies his church that's how he does it okay the next thing we're going to look at here is God, is God is going to have a glorious church. Sanctification and cleansing produce holiness. And listen to this. Holiness produces glory. Not power. That was a major mistake we've made in the charismatic movement. Okay, let me just say this again. This has got to get into those of us who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Holiness and sanctification and purity is what produces glory, not the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power with signs and wonders and miracles. I remember in what has to be the most embarrassing moment of the charismatic movement. Can anyone guess? 2008, the quote-unquote Lakeland Revival led by Todd Bentley. It's just so embarrassing. That, that so, and that we, we were, so I'm not saying, we, we, went, we participated in it as well. We learned our lesson, okay? We apologize for our mistakes. But thinking that, okay, this, this guy who didn't even preach the gospel was getting up and just doing miracles and wonders and signs and healings and all this stuff, and everyone with a name in the charismatic movement was saying, this is the next, this is, this is the end time move of the Spirit that's going to lead to the second coming. 
And then this thing ended, this quote-unquote revival ended with Todd Bentley leaving his wife for another woman. It was awful. It's terrible. I remember when it came to Cobb County Civic Center, you know, back then we were pretty ignorant of things. And I remember when it came there, the first night I remember I was like, okay, this is pretty good. I mean, I'm not really sensing like the glory, but it's pretty good. The next two nights were just terrible. And it was like this implied idea that if feathers, jewels, gold dust, or someone's teeth got gold feelings in it, then the glory of God had come. We Then we have officially arrived. That's embarrassing. Gosh, that's so embarrassing. Look at, I feel like that's looking back on yourself when you're going through puberty in middle school. It's like, God, this is so embarrassing that we actually thought, okay, Okay, gold dust and gold fillings, God's on the move. Okay, what produces glory is not power, but holiness. That's the scriptures. That's the scriptures. It's sanctification, it's cleansing, then it's glory. It's not feathers, gold fillings, gold teeth, or gold dust, or jewels, or whatever it is. The people, so many of the people that pursued that stuff are carnal as you can imagine. That does not produce the glory. Holiness and sanctification by the rhema word of God, by the living word of God spoken, by the, the word and the spirit working in harmony and union and synergy together, that is what produces sanctification and cleansing in the bride. That's why we've got to have the authentic prophetic movement. We've got to have the authentic prophetic voice of God, not the, your best life now prophetic words, but words that are rooted in the eternal plan and purpose of God. I can hardly listen to anyone who doesn't understand God's eternal purpose giving quote unquote prophetic words because so much of it is about how you'd have your best life now. And, and you know, anyway, it's like a grumpy old man. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting on something that we need to get back to in the prophetic is we've got, I, I guess the, the thing I'm gripped with is we've got to restore the prophetic for what God intended is to make his people ready. Not who the next president's going to be, not who, what the Super Bowl winner means, all that nonsense. The true now, I'm not saying there's a, never a place for some of that, some of that, I'm not going to get into all the nuances, but some of that stuff. But what I'm really hitting at is that it's the living Word of God. It's the Word of God and the Spirit of God in synergy together, working together, that cleanses and prepares the bride. It is, yeah. So, rest assured... The Lord is going to have a holy church. Okay, that doesn't mean a bored church. It doesn't mean a grumpy church. But God is going to have, holiness does not mean boredom. Holiness does not mean grumpy. Holiness is Christ-likeness. And Christ himself was called, he was anointed with the oil of gladness because he hated lawlessness and he loved righteousness. Therefore, God anointed him with the oil of gladness far above his companions. By the authority of Scripture, we can be absolutely confident. I just want to give you conf complete, total confidence that no matter the chaos that is taking place in the church, we can be completely confident on the authority of the Word of God in Scripture breathed out by the Holy Spirit with apostolic authority that God will have a glorious church before he comes back. Holy, spotless, blameless. Amen. That gives me encouragement. Based on that scripture, we can be confident that the end time move of the Holy Spirit will have as one of the most important things this work of sanctification. This work of the Holy Spirit through his ramas, the spoken word of God, the spirit and the word together to make the bride ready. 
There's coming a bridal revival. Now, I know in the charismatic church, there's a big debate about, okay, you know, some people say, well, the next great revival is going to bring in a, a billion soul harvest. And the next great awakening is going to be the greatest awakening in history. It's going to transform the seven mountains of culture. I just don't see that in the word. <laughs> I mean, I see the seven mountains of culture becoming more and more depraved and corrupt. I did not see the, the seven so-called mountains of culture being transformed. I do not believe that's the revival Scripture talks about. Others will say, well, the revival is about God's power and God's authority. Yes, I believe that. I do believe that. Some question, well, is there even going to be a revival? I do believe there is going to be an end-time move of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we're even beginning to see it right now with all this going on in the church. Maybe this is the beginning of Ephesians 5, 26 through 27 being fulfilled. Maybe that's what is, is taking place. I do believe there's going to be an end-time move of the Holy Spirit, of the Word and the Spirit preparing the bride. But I also do believe there's going to be great power and great authority in the church. But that's not the ultimate purpose of the revival. The purpose is God's eternal purpose, to make the bride ready. So based on Scripture, I do believe there will be an end-time move of the Holy Spirit. I do believe Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, 28-29 was partially fulfilled in Acts, but will be completely fulfilled at the end of the age, characterized by dreams, visions, the prophetic word, authority, and power that's going to be released. But again, we've seen from history, authority and power in and of itself does not produce glory. And many times it just produces uh, abusive leadership. If the people who are leading it are not truly inwardly Christ-like. So the, the ultimate hallmark of this last great move of the Holy Spirit is a work of sanctification, a work of holiness, a work of pure, purity that re reduces glory, and that glory and power go together to release authority in the demonstration of the Spirit of God. So you might even call this bridal revival a Rima revival. The Word and the Spirit working perfectly together to sanctify, cleanse, and purify the bride. Okay, so there's, though there's many expressions of God's remas. What I think best summarizes his rema is the perfect synergy of the Word of God, Logos, and the Spirit of God, the breath of God, the rhema, operating together in balance and harmony. The Spirit anointing and empowering the Word of God as proclaimed is what will cleanse the bride. That's what we need so bad at the end of the age. A revival of the Word and the Spirit. I started reading... Um, I don't know if you guys have heard R.T. Kendall. He was a minister. He's an American. Um, he's probably late 80s, maybe even in his 90s. Was a minister in London at Westminster Chapel. He's a theologian, but he's also very charismatic. He was really good friends with Paul Kane and uh, John Paul Jackson, very much with John Wimber and stuff like that. He's written a great book. I highly recommend the book, Prophetic Integrity. And he talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly and the charismatic movement. It's something I think right now the Lord is wanting to highlight to us to see, okay, <clears throat> what do we need to change? What do we need to learn from? But R.T. Kendall was talking, and I, I fully, fully agree with him on this, that what the end time move of the Holy Spirit is going to be characterized by the Word and the Spirit. Not the Word minus the Spirit, not the Spirit minus the Word the Word and the Spirit working perfectly together in harmony to cleanse and purify the bride. We need the Word and the Spirit. And so if you look around, there's many churches that are Word churches. And a Word church is, um, a word church is characterized by having correct doctrine and solid theology, understanding the foundational doctrines of salvation like justification by faith, emphasizing you know, verse-by-verse verse teaching, contending for the faith handed down by the apostles. 
Yes and amen. We need word churches. But we also need spirit churches together. We need word spirit churches. Not just word churches. Not just spirit churches. Word and spirit churches for what God wants to do at the end of the age. We need spirit, spirit churches are characterized by pursuing healing and miracles, signs and wonders, deliverance, the gifts of the Spirit, believing the church must be restored to the book of Acts, characterized by the pursuit of power. And so what R.T. Kendall was saying, and he's, you know, with a lot of experience, he was saying this, there are many word churches, there are many spirit churches, but it's very rare to have both. I believe what he's saying is so true at the end of the age, one of the, hallmark, uh, one of the hallmark moves of the Holy Spirit is there will be spirit and word churches. That is the, the spirit and the word working perfectly and balanced together to bring about God's eternal plan and purpose, the fulfillment and the realization of what God has always wanted. <laughs> David Watson said this. This is really good. It's, he, he, he was a minister. He passed away in 1984. You may have heard this, but it's a really good statement. If, if we have all word and no spirit, we dry up. If we have all spirit and no word, we blow up. But if we have both word and spirit, we grow up. That's really good. I wish I would have come up with that. <laughs> Say it again. All word and no spirit, we dry up. All spirit and no word, we blow up. Both word and spirit, we grow up. Amen to that. See, the Lord told the Pharisees who spent hours and hours and hours a day, he, he told them, you are mistaken. Now, that, that word means you're led astray into deception because you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. We've got to understand, if, if we want to make sure we're not deceived, at the end of the age, if we want to make sure we're not deceived at the end of the age, that's why Jesus said the first warning he was talking about, about the end of the age, was see to it that you are not deceived. See to it that you are not misled. Many will come in my name. They're not just saying I am Jesus Christ. Though that is happening. We found that out in Kenya when we were there. There was a man, I think we mentioned that to you, there's a man who said he's Jesus Christ but when the, uh, the, the crowd there got uh, um, upset with him, they were trying to crucify him over Passover or Easter, and he ran to the police. So he's not Jesus Christ. But, you know, I didn't think that was even real, but, but I don't think that's really, the, maybe that's what the Lord was saying, but I think more deceptive is ministers coming in the name of Jesus Christ, teaching truth, but inwardly not being true themselves, and leading people into deception through that. I think that's where the real deception is, and so if we want to make sure we're not led into deception at the end of the age, we've got to know the Word and the Spirit both. One of the things that, that really struck me, as, you know, as all this has been coming out about IHOP and the Mike Bickle scandal and all that, is one of the things that really um, hurt my heart was people talking about what Paul Cain, and you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Paul Cain. He had an extraordinary prophetic gift. In fact, John Wimber said that, um, John Wimber, who started the Vineyard Movement, said that one, at one service, he prophesied over 150 families, and every single thing he said was accurate. I mean, if you read the stories about Paul Cain, they're, they're, they're ridiculous how the, the prophetic gifting he had was just so off the charts, just just crazy accurate power but Jack Deere was saying this and came out recently he was saying Paul Cain with this extraordinary prophetic gift could not even explain the gospel he could not even explain the gospel Jack Deere was saying I would give him the gospel to preach at their at their meetings and he said Paul Cain did not even get the gospel message he would fumble it so badly that, that theologians were asking Jack Deere, like, you know, he, he just does not get this. And Jack was like, I couldn't argue with them. You know, just to think that we had this, this move of the Spirit with this incredible prophetic, prophetic gifting, but the simple gospel message could not be explained. I, I think that needs to say something to us as we get prepared for what God's doing in, in preparation for the second coming of Jesus is that, is that we've got to know the Word and the Spirit. 
Not the Word or the Spirit. Not the Spirit or the Word. The Word and the Spirit. Okay, so just winding this message up here. Seven hallmarks of the glorious church that we're going to begin looking at over the next two months here between Dad, myself, and Michael teaching is there's seven hallmarks of the glorious church that God's raising up. Number one, the glorious church is going to be made ready by forerunners like John the Baptist who have the Holy Spirit's anointing like Elijah, which Scripture calls the spirit and the power of Elijah. The, glor the glorious church will be made ready by forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Dad's going to talk about that next Sunday. Number two, the glorious church will be driven by God's eternal purpose. If we, are not, if, we don't, if we don't even know God has an eternal purpose, we will never be driven by that. We're going to build something that's based upon a blueprint God doesn't want. That's what's happening in most of the church. We're building things God doesn't, never even wanted. He wants what he uh, revealed as his blueprint in Scripture, the eternal plan and purpose. Number three, the glorious church will be built upon the revelation of Jesus Christ and the foundation of the gospel, the true gospel. See, the, the foundation of the glorious church is Jesus Christ. Not things about him, not doctrines about him, but Jesus himself. That the revelation of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the gospel, or the foundation of the church, and the foundation of the true gospel is what God builds his church on. So we got to understand these, these basic doctrines of salvation. Number four, the glorious church will have a revelation of the judgment seat of Christ and will be motivated to live for eternal rewards. The church right now is woefully lacking in revelation and understanding of the judgment seat of Christ and eternal rewards. And I, I mean, most people don't even have a clue about it. <clears throat> Scripture, it is everywhere in Scripture. So we've got to understand the judgment seat of Christ and eternal rewards. Number five, the glorious church will actively make herself ready as a bride for her bridegroom. The spirit and the bride will say, come. The bride has made herself ready. The, Jesus is preparing his church by his living and active word, his spirit-breathed word, that Jesus is speaking that word and purifying his bride. Number six, the glorious church will embrace death to self in order to live by Christ and dwelling life. That, man, so important. If the cross is not being preached, and I, I mean more than just the finished, no, I don't say just, more than the finished work of the cross, it is finished but the cross working in us. I mean, there really is, that's only part of the gospel, not the full gospel. We've also got to preach the cross, taking up your cross, death to self, dying to self, putting our self-life to death, putting our selfishness to death, so that the life of Jesus Christ that is in us might flow and live out of us. And then number seven, the glorious church will develop a new wineskin that can contain the new wine of the Spirit's last day outpouring and work. The glorious church will develop a new wineskin that can contain the new wine of the Spirit's last day outpouring and work. So important. How much... God wants to do that he can't do because he knows if he did, it would blow up and hurt many people. Exactly like we're seeing right now. If the wineskin is not ready, and so much of the wineskin is not just like having a better model or a better system or understanding apostles and prophets, the wineskin is about us internally 
being prepared to contain all that God wants to do. And so, just, to, just bringing this to conclusion, even though God is shaking the church, even though judgment has begun in the house of God, I want to encourage you that through this and in this, God's word is true. Jesus will have a glorious church before he comes back. We can be absolutely confident in that, that he will do what he said he would do. He will have a glorious church that is holy, spotless, and blameless. And he will do it by speaking, by his living voice and his, the, the spirit and the word working together to cleanse and purify the bride. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, I just thank you for the encouragement. I needed that myself, actually. Um, thank you for the encouragement. Thank you, Lord, that your word is clear. Father, we just want to say, we just pray this for ourselves. We pray this for the, the church in the nations, God, as we live, Lord, really at the end of the age. Lord, we pray right now, Lord God, that you would do a work of purifying your bride. You would do a work of the spirit and the bride. Do a work of the spirit and the word. Synergizing, working together, we pray, so that, that you could cleanse and sanctify and purify your bride. What I'm just saying, Lord, do a work in us. Do a work in us, Lord, that we might hear your word, hear your voice, Lord, I pray that you would stir up the Rima word of God in us. Stir up the Rima word of God. Lord, I pray that where anyone has dried up because the, the, they haven't heard the Spirit speak lately, Lord, I pray for a fresh stirring of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I just pray for anyone listening online, anyone in person that, that feels a need, the need for a fresh stirring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would begin to bring a fresh stirring of the Holy Spirit. Stir up, Lord, I pray, the gifts of God that were imparted to us through the laying on of hands. Stir up those gifts, Lord, we pray, of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let, us, let the living and active word of God be energized. Lord, let the word of the Lord be activated. Let life in the spirit be stirred up, we pray, Lord. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Give hope, Lord, we pray, in Jesus' name. Give hope, Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll end the online portion.